Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right, everyone, you are listening to your Money Momentum podcast. My name is Tom Kennedy, and I have Kevin Curley here. Kevin, what's going on? Not much in Dallas, Tom. How is the refugee life in Houston? I I see that you've made it to, are you in San Antonio or are you still in Houston? I'm still in Houston. No power, no no water. It's, uh, It's brutal. Second time this summer that you're doing one with, uh, <laughs> we'll say a struggle situation of no power, no water. So sleeping on friends. Third world city you live in down there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's brutal, but fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, my city of birth is uh, struggling down there. So, all right, Tom. Well, today we're going to be talking structured products, and very exciting. We have the return of Nostra Thomas. So why don't we just jump right in to structured products? Um, first of all, just Quickly, basic definition, what is a structured product? So we talk a lot about, and we've done a podcast on alternatives in, in, the, in the past, and I think we briefly touched on them, but it's, you know, the alternatives category is very broad. Um, you can throw in anything from REITs to, you know, uh, private traded real estate to hedge funds, et cetera. But one of those categories is what's called a structured product or a structured note. And essentially, and, and you see this a lot now in, in insurance policies as some of the investment options, but you know, 10, 15 years ago to, to truly get into a structured product, you had you had to have at least 10, 15 million and go directly to one of these investment banks that that create these products. And essentially there's different iterations of it, but in its simplest form, if you take like the S P five hundred, you take an indice and you say, Hey, over the next call it two years. Um, I'm going to invest in this indice and I have an upside cap, call it 20%. So if the market's up 30, you're up 20. If the market's up 10, you're up 10. But you have what's called a buffer. You have a downside protection. And if you have a 20% cap, maybe your downside buffer is 10. And that cap might be a little high. I'm just throwing out some random numbers. So if you have a 10% buffer after the two-year period, if the S&P is down five, you're flat. If the S&P is down 10, you're flat. If the S&P is down 15, you're down five. So they protect you in the first 10%. And there's so many different flavors and, and iterations of these structured notes. You can do them on individual stocks. You can do them on multiple different indices and do the worst let's, of. Let's, and- let's, let's, uh, before we jump all into the details and all that, let's, let's kind of keep it a high level first. So the first part is it's a debt instrument issued by one of these investment banks. So it could be JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, all these different banks are issuing these, these structured notes. Why, why do they issue them? Well, they, you know, these investment banks, they make a lot of money on these on these structured notes. Um, they're investing in debt, as you mentioned. It's usually tied to some sort of bond, and they tie that duration of that note to the duration of maturity of that bond. And then there's options that they do. They go into the option market, and they use derivatives um, to write calls and puts and short these different strategies to help generate income. And it, it can get very complex on how they do them. But these investment banks, this is one of their... Uh, this is one of their profit streams. They make a, a good amount of money and they realized that opening opening these structured notes up to the everyday investor, um, they can gather more assets by doing that. So if we start kind of at the basics and I was interested in buying a structured product, what's like the most basic plain vanilla? Would that be like a market link CD or a different type of structured note? Yeah, there's 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 a couple different kinds. The, the, the first one is what's called fully principal protected, meaning that your principal is not at risk, um, subject to issuer risk. Obviously, it's like investing in anything else. If the issuer issuing it goes bankrupt, well, there's your your credit risk. But you have what's called a market link CD, which acts and feels a lot like a CD. You know, there's could be a one year, two year duration or hold on it like you would have in the traditional CD. Um, instead of getting an interest rate, it's going to be tied to an indice like the S&P 500. So going back to that example, you might have a cap on that and, you, and you're going to have um, 100% of that principal protected, but the cap's not going to be very great. It might be 7 or 8% 
over two years. Um, it might do better than a CD, but you're not going to get the interest that a CD would pay, but you're fully protected, meaning if the market's down, you get your money back. So when you say principal protected, does that mean FDIC insurance? It doesn't mean FDIC insurance. So that's that's the biggest drawback with a structured note or a market link CD versus an actual CD is the CD is FDIC insured, um, where uh, a market link CD is 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 an investment. So okay. you get so you get your money. This is back. basically a different version of a CD. Instead of uh, prevailing interest rates, I just get whatever the S and P five hundred or another indices performance is, subject to a cap, but. In theory, that cap is going to be a lot higher than prevailing interest rates, and that's why I would do it. Exactly. So, if you do a two-year, if you do a two-year market link CD, you want that cap to be probably north of ten percent because you can get CDs now for for five percent. So, five mm -hmm. percent over two years is is ten. Now, as rates go down, CDs will go down. That's one of the drawbacks of CDs is once they mature, you have to reinvest, and interest rates could be a lot lower. Um, but there's opportunity cost at hand too, meaning if the market does not perform. And it's actually down. Yeah, you don't lose money because you get your principal back. But if you were in a CD, you were collecting that 5% interest mm -hmm. each year or whatever it was. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Who is this type of product, specifically the market link CD? Like, what's the profile of an investor that this makes sense for? And who does not make sense for? And along those lines, should it be in an IRA or should this be in a taxable account? Uh, IRA is always it is always preferred, um, just because you don't have to pay capital gains tax or any tax until until you take that money out. I would say risk profile. It's very similar to a CD client. A CD client is very very conservative. They don't want their money tied to the market. So risk profile wise, you know you're not going to lose money on these market linked CDs again unless the issuer goes bankrupt. Um, however, what these what these strategies are not for a lot of those CD clients are doing those CDs for income. So if you're looking for income, a market link CD is probably not the route because this is more for, hey, I'm conservative, but I do want I do want exposure to the market in case the market continues to go up. And although there's a cap, I can take advantage of that versus a CD investor, also conservative, but may need that five, five and a half percent income each year to live off of. Okay. So that seems like kind of the basics, the simple one, easy to understand. Um, there's some tax things you probably want to check with your CPA and make sure you have that right. Um, Cause my traditional interest from a CD is ordinary income. And maybe that structured product gives off ordinary income, maybe capital gains, depending on how the returns are. Um, what another example I, I've heard of these uh, auto callable notes. Um, there's participation notes. What, what's kind of the second, if we're going up the chain ladder and going, okay, market link CDs, that's kind of level one. What's level two and level three look like? And when do I use those? Yeah, so I would say level two is when you have some of your principal at risk, meaning you, you don't risk all of it. You have some kind of downside buffer, um, but you still can lose money based on on the market if it goes through that buffer amount. And there's two, there's two different... Um, categories. It's it's income driven or growth driven, or sometimes there's a hybrid and combination of the two. But for clients that that need income, you can invest in these structured notes that aren't that aren't geared towards growth or geared towards generating a monthly income stream. And these monthly income streams tend to be higher than your traditional bond or CD or or money market type fund. <clears throat> they, per, they, they participate in the equity market, but they're going to be able to generate a much higher income based on where the indices are. So they have these they have these CDs where every month they pay income. And as long as the market doesn't go below a certain point, usually 30%, you get paid that income. If it drops below 30% that given month, you just skip that month for that income. And once it gets back up that above that buffer amount, then you start receiving the income. So it's kind of get the best of both worlds. And at the end of the at the end of the deal, whether it's a one year deal, two year, they go out to five years, um, there's also protection against the principal. So if the market, if it's a five year deal and the market were to be down, you have a buffer, call it 15, 20, maybe even 30%. So as long as it's not down more than 30% from point to point from when you started over that five year time period, which has never happened, um, you're not you're gonna get your principal back. So Tom, and along the way, you I hear all that talking, and I go, I want to go buy these. I'm going to go uh, to my broker dealer or my brokerage account and type in an ETF, and I'm just going to pull up a structured product and buy it, right? Pretty simple. Just buy it right off the shelf. 
Yeah. So you mentioned ETF. So there's there's an ETF version. There's different vehicles you can buy these structured notes in. They they ETFs have become very very popular because they're fully liquid. So they work very similar. You can go in and out of them just like any other ETF. Uh, but the terms aren't as great because you have that liquidity, and anyone can buy that in a brokerage account or, or a fee based account. Um, the other the other vehicle is doing the actual customized structure note through the investment bank, whether it's JP Morgan, Barclays, HSBC, there's, there's, there's a, a ton of them that offer these structure notes. And that's when you have the terms, you can always get out of these notes, but you're just subject to whatever the market is at that time. Um, but there's a lot that goes into how we price them out because that's when we can start to negotiate with these investment banks on better deals, better terms, you know, bigger buffers, higher caps, et cetera. All right. Um, any extra risk that we should be aware of if we're going to add these to the portfolio? What's the really big benefit? I know we've talked about alternatives before of having a sleeve in there. It can help with kind of the advanced metrics when it comes to portfolio performance, risk adjuster returns, that type of thing. Is this fall into that bucket as just like a, a different thing than stocks and bonds or how, do, how does this fit in overall portfolio asset allocation? It it does. You know, we use these as as a pure hedge. Um, you're not, you know, we use kind of that version two where you have some principal at risk and we just did some that had fully principal protected because we think it made sense. But you're using it as a hedge. It's it's gonna it's gonna act a lot like the the equity markets because you're gonna be tied to the indice, but you know if the market's down a certain percent, you're at least protected for X amount percent. So it, it keeps you invested in the market. Um, it hedges the portfolio really nicely. It brings down the correlation. So everything's not moving in the same direction and it just provides some protection. And in return, you're going to give a little upside return. So, you know, you look at, you say you did a two year deal where you had the S and P, you had a cap of 15% and a downside of 10. Well, you're making a bet over the next two years that the S and P is going to fall anywhere from up 15 to down 10. Um, anything outside of those two, you lose, start to lose, you lose money on, but then you got to look at the rest of your account and you're going to be investing in other stocks and bonds that are also going to be down. So this is a great way to just, just hedge the portfolio and really just smooth out the volatility. Yeah, so something different that hopefully also has a positive return, and that diversification can be pretty valuable in the long run. Yep, it just Any, it just allows you to get off the sidelines. If you're very very conservative, but you know you hate seeing the market continue to go up, you just don't want to take all the risk. This is kind of a good good in between. All right, great. Well, let's uh, go see what Nostra Thomas thinks about all this. And now we ask our soothsayer to gaze into his crystal ball. Let's hear from the alchemist himself. Nostra Thomas. <laughs> All right, let's do it. All right. So the return of Nostra Thomas, it's been quite a while. I don't know if it's been months or years, but I feel like he's been hiding for a while. So hopefully he can dust off his crystal ball and help us out here. So Richard Bernstein recently wrote that U.S. stocks may be headed for a lost decade due to higher valuations. Some areas, especially those associated with the AI trade, are trading at 14 times their projected earnings. And the S&P 500 is pretty high at a 23, almost 23 PE ratio. So Nostra Thomas, are U.S. stocks at risk at another lost decade like 20, sorry, 2000 to 2010? Yeah, so let's so so the answer is no. Um, but let's take a quick <laughs> recap of what what 2000 and 2010 looked like. You had two major crashes. You had the tech bubble in 2001, and then you had the GFC in 2008. So if you invested in the S and P 500 in January 1st, 2000, and looked at your account January 1st, 2010, you had almost a zero percent rate of return because you had you know a 40 and 45 percent, two 40 to 45 percent declines during that decade. Um, I don't, I don't think we're going to be in a, in a lost decade. Um, I think that think was, we uh, look in your crystal ball and tell us the result. We don't want to think. <laughs> well, my crystal ball has been a little, 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 <laughs> little, little, little hazy last, last couple couple of years. Um, listen, there's, there's valuations are extremely high right now. There's no question about that. It's been fueled by AI. You have, PE ratios uh, at all time highs, especially on the tech side. So I think you're going to naturally get a, a reset. But this reminds me a lot of 2020. You had so much, and you look at all the other past bubbles, you had a lot of stimulus that was dumped into the market. I mean, we had $7 trillion during COVID that was pumped into the market, $7 trillion, which is 
unheard of. Our M2 money supply, which is all the cash available in, in money market CDs and savings accounts, was at $16 trillion. And overnight, we went to 23. So you have all this money in the market, and it's got to go somewhere. And last year, you had $7 trillion of that go into money market funds. And what you're seeing right now reminds you a lot of 2020. You have all this money coming off the sidelines and chasing stocks. So I think it's, I, don't, I wouldn't call it a bubble, but there's definitely some sectors that that are, 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 are elevated because of that money going into the market. So I think you're going to get a reset. I'm not calling for a massive crash, but to get another lost decade, you would have to see two pretty big crashes. Um, and I don't, th I don't foresee that happening. All right. So the next thing comes from just across the Atlantic. England's elections ended 14 years of conservative party rule and put the labor back in the prime minister's chair. Meanwhile, there's been major changes from groups that ran Mexico for a long time being unseated, and France just had an election on Sunday. It's going to shake up a lot of what they have going on. Uh, I know it's dangerous, but what does Nostra Thomas think is crystal ball showing for the U.S. election? I think we put way, way, way too much emphasis with the election and the U.S. stock market. And you look at the charts. And oh, no, I don't mean back. about the stock market. I mean, what's the result? We want to know the crystal <laughs> well, ball who wins. The result is clear. Um, you know, after that debate and after the I poll, the candidates are clear. How can the result be clear? <laughs> I, I think, well, that's why it's clear. <laughs> I, I I would find it very hard to believe that the Democrats take take the White House. I think the the GOP. Uh, I think they pick up two or three seats on the Senate, um, make, keep control of the House, and I think it's going to be a, a clean sweep across the board. So I think we will see Donald J. Trump sitting in the White House November, was it November 6th or 4th? And um, oh, I think you will see a knee-jerk reaction up on the stock market, and I think that will be a good time to take some gains and to rebalance. And if – if Biden does does take office, which I, I highly doubt, but if he does, you, you probably will see a sell-off and it'll be a good opportunity to buy. Great. Well, that was a very definitive answer. Uh, so we're over a year now since the last banking crisis that took down Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic, among others. Uh, what does Nostradamus see in his crystal ball about the next crisis or the next black swan event? Typically unpredictable, but you have that power. So what's I, it going to be? Do I do have that power, and I will tell you the one thing that keeps me up at night is the sovereign debt crisis that we have in our country, $33 trillion and, and counting. You look at the, the 2024 budget, um, we had projected a trillion and a half deficit. It looks like that's going to be closer to two by the end of the year. Um, that is that is not good. That that is bad. You just and we've talked about this before. You look at just the debt interest, just the interest they have. The government has to finance our debt is going to be at one trillion. That's more than our defense spending. Uh, the the challenge is going to come is what our government. You're going to see you're going to see a Netflix documentary or books written about this in the years to come. But how reckless the government was by not refinancing some of our debt when we had all time low interest rates. As this debt matures, they're going to have to issue new debt at much higher rates. Even someone who has no idea about finances, everyone knows that when interest rates are low, what do you do? You refinance your house. And a lot of people did that. Why didn't our own government refinance our debt? So I don't even know. This could be a catastrophe. The next step is a downgrade. If we get downgraded, well, what happens to interest rates? Interest rates will go up because you have to be compensated to 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 buy lower sovereign graded debt. I mean, you saw yeah, what happened. Treasury's with actually Brexit. rallied on the last downgrade, but in theory, you are correct. That's how the math works. In, in, in theory, <laughs> in theory, in theory, we're writing IOUs and um, <laughs> from AAA listen, to double A and rally <laughs> yields rally. You're like, okay, all right, cool. It, 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 <laughs> so that could be the next. And I don't even think it's a black swan. I think it's clear as day out there that we have a massive, massive issue. But I don't know what that looks like because we don't have you know Germany to bail us out like they did with the other um, EU countries. So it could, it could get pretty ugly. However, there is a way out. It's yeah. called growth. That's, a, that's yeah. one. That's the, that's the more fun, easy way out. There's other ways out too, but uh, all right. So we're going to move on to something of a little bit about volatility. I'm going to kind of accidentally call somebody out, but they wrote the article in a public paper so they can deal with it. 
In February 2023, the CIO of Guggenheim Partners, Ann Walsh, said investors should not expect relief from volatility. Volatility was here to stay. Volatility wasn't going anywhere. Since then, the VIX has fallen 40% and has been calm, and she basically top-ticked the volatility regime that was happening back then. Now I'm going to give Nostra Thomas an opportunity to do the opposite and say these low volatility times that we're having right now, we're at 12 or at a 13, we're at a very low, it's very calm, market just kind of goes up a little bit every day, very quietly. Uh, are you willing to call a bottom in the VIX like Ann accidentally top ticked it or uh, volatility continuing on? What, what do you see in that crystal ball? I don't know if Ann Wallace and Meredith Whitney are, are having lunch together every day, but uh, if there's an ETF that we could short their opinions, it would be we'd all make a lot, a lot, a lot of money. That might have been the dumbest call I've ever heard because the vol, the VIX is is a, is a is what they call the fear gauge. It just goes up and down based on the volatility in the market. And a good way to look at the VIX is you look at what the VIX is divided by sixteen, and that's going to be your expected uh, daily volatility or percentage swings in the S&P. So for instance, the S, uh, the VIX right now is what, 12? So 12 divided by 16 is 0.75%. You're going to see an average 0.75% swings in the S&P. If the VIX was at 16, um, you're going to see 1% swings. When it gets up to 30, that's a 2% swing. So I think volatility is going to remain low throughout the year because I don't think you're going to have a lot of movement in the market. I don't, I don't foresee some major massive sell-off. Um, and if there is, the VIX will shoot up. It's not like it's a stock and there's earnings and you can predict it. It moves with the market and it's, it's a fear gauge. So again, as people get more, more, more pessimistic and things start to sell off, you'll see the VIX start to creep up. But being under 20 is pretty is pretty low and uh, we've been there and and by the way you look at the S&P 500 since since the uh since the silicon valley banking crisis we haven't had a 2% swing uh, on the S&P which is going over, well over a year so you mm-hmm. see, you're seeing a very very low volatility in this market which is a good thing for the for it's the been a few months since we've seen a 1% swing too so it has uh, we'll yep. see how <laughs> if we can get down to half a percent no more <laughs> keep it really really low vol All right. So the final one, uh, Howard Marks, who we like to reference, he's a pretty well-known figure. He's written about the importance of taking the temperature of the trading herd. So what does Wall Street think? What is a consensus? What's retail think? Just kind of getting an idea of it. So I was curious if Notre Thomas has a a thermometer and can take the temperature of the current trading herd. It is hot. It is hot (laughs) right now. And something that something that I look at is the bull bear spread. There's a lot of different indicators out there, but it just shows, hey, is the average investor optimistic or pessimistic? They look at it from an institutional level. They look at it from a financial advisor level. Um, And optimism is extremely high right now. You have this kind of FOMO taking place in the market with, you know, everyone's darling stocks like NVIDIA that have just been on a massive, massive run in anything AI related. So I think the temperature is extremely hot, which unfortunately doesn't usually end well and it'll end with some kind of resetting. But, you know, we've seen these periods run and run for quite some time. Again, this reminds me a lot of 2020, not as extreme, but you could see this run throughout the rest of the year. But there's going to be there's going to be a resetting. And you know, like what Warren Buffett says, you know, sell when things are high and buy when they're low. And things are starting to get up there, especially in certain sectors like like tech. All right. Well, thank you, Nosha Thomas. In a few months, we'll we'll see you again, maybe, and uh, get some more well, predictions, maybe post-election. Nosha Thomas only comes out when he's right. So uh, <laughs> broken we'll <see>. clock, right? <laughs> broken clock. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thanks, Tom. And thanks, Nosha Thomas. We'll see you next All time. All right. Thanks, Kevin. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum, brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.